Good afternoon. Welcome back to the closing keynote here at Future Decoded. My name's Steve Clayton. I'm the chief storyteller at Microsoft, and it's the second time I've been up on this stage, and it's great to be back in the UK, where I'm originally from, despite the slightly odd accent that sits somewhere between here and Redmond these days. But I'm excited this afternoon to take you on this journey, the story of quantum computing. You heard this morning, you saw this slide actually from Panos, and he talked about these three trends in technology. And in fact, in chapter six of this book, Hit Refresh, that hopefully some of you may have seen or read, that Satya published last month. So Satya Nadella writes in this book in chapter six, he calls it Beyond the Cloud. And when he talks about Beyond the Cloud, he talks about these three technology areas. And you've heard a great deal, at least about the first two today, and maybe some of you have been to the breakout sessions we've had today on quantum computing. But you've heard about mixed reality, You've heard about artificial intelligence, how it's being infused throughout all of Microsoft's products and is going to be this tidal wave of technology in all of our products and services over the next few years. But we're going to spend the next 45 minutes or so talking about quantum computing. And this is a radically different thing. So if any of you are sat out there with your red hat on that you got from the expo from Red Hat, it's time to hold on to your hat. Because this is a completely different field of technology. It's a phenomenally exciting area of technology. I'm excited to be able to bring two of our greatest researchers to talk about it here today. But a little bit of why are we talking about quantum computing? Why, in fact, does the world need quantum computing? We have enormous computing capability today in Azure, 40 Azure regions around the world. Each of those regions capable of being able to, in the data center, the size of each of those data centers could store 16 jumbo jets. So we're not short of computing power. We have almost infinite computing power. But there are still some technology challenges that are outside of the scope of that computing power. If we want to see Blue Planet 3, then we're going to have to do some work around climate change. And quantum computing could be the technology to help us unlock some of those challenges around climate change. If we want to have breakthroughs in food production, to enable all of the planet to be able to eat and have a healthy diet and to be able to simply have food, quantum computing, again, could be the technology to unlock some of the breakthroughs in that field. And if we want to find work around antibiotic resistance in medicine and healthcare, some of the challenges that still lie there, they are still grand challenges that can't be solved with today's classical computers. So that's why we're here today to talk about quantum computing to sort of go under the covers a little bit to understand what this technology is all about and why it will unlock those frontiers of technology and frontiers of grand challenges that we have as a society. Now, Microsoft has amassed a dream team. Literally, our global quantum dream team operates around the globe, from Redmond to the Netherlands, the UK to Sydney. Across the globe, we have a team of some of the leading experts in the world on quantum. And I'm delighted to have two of them here today to take you down under the covers and explain a little bit what this technology is all about. And this is what we're going to talk about over the next 45 minutes or so. Why quantum computing is different. It literally is a fundamentally different type of computing. How Microsoft is building a quantum computer. How our approach is unique. There are other companies, other industries who are looking at quantum computers. There's been lots of news around it recently. But Microsoft is genuinely taking a unique approach in something we call the topological qubit that you'll hear about uh, in the next few moments. And we'll talk about some of these grand challenges and how we'll be able to address them using the power of quantum computing. So let's get started. Quantum computing really is different. Most of us in the room probably know about classical bits, about ones and zeros. But we're going to hear a little bit about quantum bits and how they are dramatically different down at the physical level, down at the atomic level, to allow us to build these quantum computers. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome a friend of mine, Dr. Leo Cohenhoven, from our research institute in the Netherlands, to come and talk a little bit about the first part of this story. Please welcome Leo to the stage. Thank you, Steve. 
Let me start by uh, noting that uh, for about 4,000 years, the principle of encoding information and calculating of information hasn't changed much. Whether we're moving balls in the abacus from left to right or move around zero, bits of zeros and ones in a modern chip, the principles are the same. Left, right, zero, one, different names for the same principle. If, however, we move to quantum computers, then we're actually going to start building entirely new building blocks, start with new principles to build a bigger computer. And these new quantum building blocks actually fit better to attack some of the problems that at this moment are still unsolvable. And this, this classical uh, IT that we're using at the moment does have some limits. Okay, we're bound to encoding information to zeros and ones, and for some of the problems that we're using it for, it's amazingly fast. The search on the internet is very, very fast. It's amazing. But let me give you an example when classical IT actually has sincere limits. Here you see a supercomputer somewhere located in China, and it can calculate the chemical properties of small molecules. For instance, the molecule of, for coffee, caffeine. However, if I make the molecule slightly bigger, for instance, this iron molybdenum complex, it's only slightly bigger, the computer can no longer calculate the chemical behavior of that molecule. Somehow, chemistry is a problem that scales very poorly on classical IT. Now, biology is full of larger molecules that are completely out of reach for an understanding based on a computation. For quantum mechanics, or quantum IT, the principles of the quantum mechanics is that we're actually you know, invented or thought about in the context of, of small particles. For instance, in the context of how atoms glue together and form molecules. In fact, chemistry is just one of the applications of quantum mechanics. And that includes all of chemistry, including all the chemistry in our bodies. So can we use these powerful principles of quantum mechanics, whatever they are, for IT and solve problems that are currently still unsolvable? Now let's see what one of the founders of quantum theory says. This is Richard Feynman. There was a time uh, when the newspapers said that only 12 men understood the theory of relativity. I don't believe there ever was such a time. There might have been a time when only one man did, because he's the only guy who caught on when he, before he wrote his paper. But after people read the paper, a lot of people kind of understood the theory of relativity in some way or other. But more than 12. On the other hand, I think I can safely say that uh, nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like, and if you will simply admit that maybe she does behave like this, you will find her a delightful, entrancing thing. Now, I actually recognize these laughing students. I remember from my physics class in general relativity, where I maybe scored something like a B plus, and could even have been a B minus. Although the B minus, I still felt that I understood the principles. For quantum mechanics, even after years of working in the same field, I got used to it, but still with my colleagues, we're arguing about the fundamental interpretation still every day. So it's a very different type of theory. It's counterintuitive. It's weird. And as Richard Feynman says, you know, it's safe to say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Now Feynman ended by saying something about the need to have quantum mechanics for understanding nature, and in particular, understanding the beauty of nature. Nature speaks the language of quantum mechanics. To understand simple things like why grass is green or why a leaf is green, we need quantum mechanics. We need the counterintuitive principles of quantum mechanics. And to illustrate this a little bit, let me just take a very simple molecule, oxygen where two oxygen atoms are bound together by a covalent bond and form O2. Now, the bond comes from sharing a single electron over the two oxygen atoms. And this sharing is not done by putting the electron just in the middle between the two atoms 
It's also not done by having the electron jumping back and forth between the two atoms. It occurs by the electron, or the, the electron makes it happen by splitting itself up and sit on the same, at the same time, on the two different atoms. Simultaneously, it can, it can occupy the two different atoms at different locations. It can be in two different positions at the same time. That is one of those weird quantum mechanical principles that we call superposition. Now, atoms are small, so you know, we don't, we're not really impressed if an electron sits at two different positions within a molecule. But we've extended these principles in small transistor devices. We've been able, within semiconductor material, to make small boxes that can hold exactly one single electron. Now, in, when we make devices with two boxes with one electron, we can actually encode information whether the electron sits in the left box or in the right box. Left box, let's say, is a qubit zero, or a bit zero, and right box is a bit one. Now, if we set ourselves up, if we set ourselves up, yeah, we're setting ourselves up, for having just one electron in the left box. Now, if, if we make the device similar as we know what happens in nature, the electron can actually split itself up and form a superposition and occupy both boxes at the same time. Now, this no longer is restricted to the atomic scale, like the angstrom scale. This now extends over micrometers. We can, we can scale up the length scale to micrometers as we need for ordinary uh, computing devices. The superposition of having the electron both in the left box and in the right box is what we call a quantum bit or a qubit. Now we have encoded in a zero and a one at the same time. It's not just either zero or one, it's zero and one at the same time. Now this superposition, can I illustrate why this is actually useful for a computation? Well, if you think about the problem of a maze, and the problem of the maze, the way we solve it, is that we just we try until success, sequentially. Until success, if we have success, we, we know that we have success, we, we found the answer. But we try sequentially. If we can make use of a superposition, then we can just try all paths, all possible paths at once, reaching success a lot faster. So doing computations in parallel can reach, for, at least for certain problems, success much faster. Now qubits, quantum bits. You may have heard the story of Schrodinger's cat. Schrodinger's cat that can be dead or alive at the same time. It's, it's, a, it's popularized in many you know, texts and many uh, you know, popular writings on quantum mechanics. Now, we will not be using cats in our computers. Cats will not be the qubits in our computers. We will use a quantum particle that was first proposed by an Italian physicist, and somehow it loses signal, by an Italian physicist, Ettore Majorana. And Ettore Majorana predicted the particle in 1937, a mysterious particle that was actually never detected until a few years ago. And normal particles, like an electron, have a charge and a spin. The spin is kind of a magnetic moment that can point up or down. It's like a little magnet. Now here you see that we, in, or it illustrates, that we can make a superposition of an electron spin. And in this example, it's about 70% up and 30% down. But as you can see, it wiggles a little bit. And there's noise around its average. And the noise is unavoidable because there are always other electrons nearby, and all the other electrons also have spins. And they're all interacting, just the same as magnets are interacting a little bit with each other. So the quantum information that we had originally stored in that one first electron is now leaking out to all the other electrons, to all the other spins in the environment. We're losing the quantum information, which makes it very difficult to perform long calculations. Now, how can we prevent this? And Myron had, had an idea that I'd like to illustrate with this metaphor of Greek dancers. Imagine that you're holding you know, your neighbor. Then 
that freezes out all the motion uh, between the, the dancers. Only the two dancers at the very end can make some strange movements. You, the rest is moving as one collective unit. Now, can we do something similar with electrons? And the idea is that all the electrons in the middle hold each other, and that only the, the two electrons at the very end can have some motion, have some freedom for motion. Now, this was exactly Majorana's idea. He was thinking about a row of electrons. Uh, for instance, you can imagine it as a row of electrons occupying a row of seats. Now, you could actually do a little experiment by, if there's a, ro a row of seats that is completely filled, except for one chair, then if everybody sits over, goes over by one chair, what happens to the empty seat is that it jumps over to the very other end. So by, by collective motion of one, moving over one chair, the empty seat moves over a long distance. And also for these electrons, if, if all the electrons move over one side, the empty space moves over to the other end. And this can happen back and forth. Now, we're not doing a classical movement of the empty chair. We can, in fact, make use of a superposition. And what the superposition allows you to do is that the empty chair is actually at the same time left and right. The electron, one of the electrons actually splits up in two pieces, it fractures, and the two pieces are now at the very end of the system where there's still some freedom of motion. This is again what we call a superposition of the electron state occupying two very uh, far separated uh, sites. Now this long separation effectively disconnects the two quantum states. And it provides a protection, it's what we call a topological protection, for leaking the quantum, the quantum information into the rest of the environment. And these two end states are known as the Majorana particles, predicted in 1937, but only detected in 19, or, or 2012 in our lab in the Netherlands. So this Majorana bit, because of the separation of the quantum information that, be, that is now protected, becomes a very stable, robust building block for making a qubit. And if you have a robust building block for a qubit, then scaling to a circuit and to a full-scale quantum computer becomes a lot easier. And so while normal electrons or normal qubits, if you want to scale it up, it's like building a house of cards. It's a nightmare for engineers. While if you have a Lego building block, it's going to be fun to build up to larger structures. And that's exactly what, what we want to do. Uh, we are engineers, and we like to build things. And there was another famous saying from Richard Feynman, when he once said, like, shut up and calculate. And we've changed that in the slogan, shut up and engineer. And this is exactly what we are doing at this very moment. Build qubits, build quantum circuits. Now, how we do that, and to give you an impression what the daily life is in our laboratory, I want to show you a little movie. And that will name it, you may not love. Okay, hier zijn we in de clean room, dus kom maar mee, kijken waar we die qubits aan het maken zijn. Hier zijn we in een speciale ruimte met een andere kleur licht. Voor eigenlijk is het heel standaard scheikunde. We hebben gewoon een, een, een vlak substraatje. Er moet een lichtgevoelige laag op aangebracht worden. We verwarmen het en die chip die wordt zelf gebakken. Hier heb ik zo'n voorbeeld chip. Dat chipje kunnen we in dit apparaat stoppen. Die gaat dan over dat chipje bepaald patroontjes krijgen. En door daar een bepaald patroontje te definiëren op de computer, kunnen we qubits maken. Dus eigenlijk hebben we nu de basispatronen, maar er moet nog wat extra's op. Je ziet hier een heel groot apparaat. En hier maken we hele fijne materialen. Eigenlijk zijn het hele dunne draadjes, die uh, veel dunner zijn dan een haar. Die nanodraadjes, zoals we ze noemen, die moeten op dit chipje komen om de qubit 
uh, helemaal af te maken. Hier zijn we in de meethal waar we de kwantumcomputers testen. Er is wel heel veel lawaai hier en dat komt omdat we die, die kwantumcomputer moeten afkoelen in een grote koelkast naar hele lage temperaturen. Vlak bij het absolute nulpunt. Zo ziet de kwantumcomputer eruit. De koelkast en daarbinnen zit dan een elektronische chip met onze qubits. Pretty cool, huh? Is everyone following along? <laughs> All right, there's going to be a test at the end for sure. You don't get to leave the room unless you can explain a Majorana particle. But Leo, I wanted to say thank you. We're going to invite you back on for some more Q&A later. But I was following along. There was an error in the video, I think, around the temperature. You found an error? I did. I saw an error in the video. Can you explain it? Good job. Yeah, so somehow lost in translation. I was saying in Dutch, absolute zero temperature. And it was translated as absolute or zero Celsius. That's not absolute zero temperature, zero Kelvin, which is about 273 degrees below zero Celsius. That is what we call absolute zero. Okay, fantastic. So that's another challenge for making a quantum computer. We have to cool it down to very, very, very low temperatures. All right, and I think we're going to hear more about that in a moment, and we'll see you later. Thank you so much. Big hand for Leo, please, everyone. So there genuinely will be a test later on. You don't get to leave without passing the test. But I am going to try and summarize it for you briefly right now. So let me give this a go. I think so far, if I'm following along correctly, in quantum computing terms, it is computer says no and yes at the same time. No, didn't work. That was my vague attempt at a joke. Didn't work. Maybe we'll just move on. So we're going to take you into the second part of the story, the twist in the story, around these qubits. Why are the qubits that Microsoft is trying to create so special and so different? And it is a very different approach that we are taking. Simply to say that our qubits, Microsoft qubits, are not like anybody else's qubits in this quantum journey. And so nobody better to come and talk to you about that, why we're building these qubits, how we're building them, than Dr. Christus Foray. So please welcome Krista to the stage. you about the software, the tools that we're going to use to program this amazing quantum computer, and the qubits that Leo has just uh, showed to you, uh, and, and the large comprehensive stack. So let's talk more about this. Here we go. So at Microsoft, we're working on developing the complete quantum computer a comprehensive stack that spans everything from the hardware, the qubits, the cryogenic control, to the software, the programming languages you're going to use to write your quantum programs and to ask the quantum computer to give you solutions to some of the world's most challenging problems. We're working on a universal programmable quantum computer, and we're identifying the revolutionary applications that you'll be able to run on it. So in addition to the qubit, as we heard from Leo, the topological qubit that's going to sit at the very coldest temperatures, millikelvin temperatures, uh, inside this dilution refrigerator, in addition to that, we're building a cryogenic classical computer. This is unlike any classical computer we have today. It will run around 4 Kelvin, you know, around minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. And this classical computer will control and help program and control the quantum chips that sit at millikelvin temperatures. And then, of course, in addition to the, the hardware, we need software, right? Software to program and control the quantum computer. And at Microsoft, of course, we're also developing the software stack to enable programming and controlling this quantum computer at scale to large numbers of qubits to large, powerful computational algorithms. Now, this system will sit in the cloud, right? These delusion refrigerators are life-size, you know, is larger than me. Uh, and they're not going to sit in your, in your office at work. They're definitely not going to sit in your pocket like your mobile device, right? It's going to sit in the cloud. And it's going to be one of the accelerator options in Microsoft's cloud. 
in Azure. So just as today you have options to send your algorithms and applications to a mix of GPUs, CPUs, FPGAs, uh, Quantum will be one of those options for you as you think about accelerating applications for your businesses. Now let's talk a little bit more about how these qubits work, about the topological qubit. And this comes to error correction. Not all qubits are created equal, and so we need to speak about error correction. Error correction is one of the fundamental concepts in computer science, something we're using every day in technology. Uh, for example, fault tolerance and error correction is fundamental to CD-ROMs, hard disks, how we protect memory and the underlying information we want to store in it. This is also true of our quantum computer. We also need forms of error correction. And we want to use error correction in a way that makes it very efficient to protect our qubits and protect the quantum information. Quantum computers, after all, are far more susceptible to noise, which is why, of course, we're running them in a very cold dilution refrigerator to protect them from thermal noise. Fault tolerance and error correction is critical to think about as we build up this comprehensive, large-scale quantum computer. So not all qubits are created equal. We're working on what's called a topological qubit, and it has very distinct error correction properties. So on this plot here, we have on the x-axis number of qubits, and on the y-axis we have error rate. Now, if we move along the x-axis, if we just think about numbers of qubits, and we don't think about what kind of qubits or how good they are, right, you might think more qubits is always better. But more qubits are not always better if they're not good enough to actually handle the computations we want to perform on these qubits. We want to scale and actually solve the world's most challenging problems with these qubits. And so at Microsoft, instead of just pushing on getting more qubits, we instead push against the y-axis, error rate. We want better qubits. As Leo mentioned, the building block, it's critical that we choose the right building block from which to scale out our large quantum computer. And so at Microsoft, we think about moving to lower and lower error rates, that is, better and better qubits that are robust against noise and errors that have high fidelity, that are going to allow us to scale to large computations to solve the world's most challenging problems. The topological qubit will get us there. Better error rates, better foundation, allows us to rapidly scale to large numbers of really good qubits, allowing us to solve the world's hardest problems. This is pretty powerful. The topological qubit is key to scaling up rapidly and solving these problems for our businesses and for the world. We're talking about reliable computation in the quantum computer, reliable storage, and rapid scaling. Now, you may be wondering, what am I going to do with this, and how does it work? I want to give a little bit more of an intuitive feel for error correction on this topological qubit before we jump to the applications we're going to solve. Now, you can imagine, to you know, kind of to understand the robustness of our qubit versus other types of qubits, let's say you want to keep track of information. And let's just pretend we're living thousands of years ago and we didn't have computers and calculators and all of that. So one way is you could leave marks on a rock, say, with chalk, right? So I could, I could mark, like on the left, I can mark chalk marks and keep track. Alternatively, I can take lessons from the Incans. And this beautiful design on the right is called a quipu. And this is how the Incans tracked information. Instead of marking with chalk or drawing lines in the sand, they instead took string, braids, and knotted them. Now, you can probably imagine why this is more powerful. Say rain comes, wind comes, a storm comes, right? If my information is stored in chalk marks or drawings in the sand, it will wash away. I have no protection against that storm. But if I had stored my information in knots, 
This is robust to a storm. Now, in fact, this analogy is even closer than you may think. Our topological qubits, in fact, are knots and braids. In mathematics, we talk about topology, and in fact, our qubit relies on topology, on this area of mathematics, which, in fact, relies on knots and braids to compute. Knots and braids in space-time, rather than, of course, in just a, a, a physical string. So Leo mentioned this qubit, right? It's, it's, uh, it relies on these fractionalized electrons to store our information. And they're stored, you know, in a sense, across the string of electrons, right? Now, if we want to compute with this, this uh, set of electrons, with this, this qubit, this type of qubit, envision it like a string. And now let's take a few of them. And now I'm going to start my computation, and it's just like a braid. In time, I start to braid the information from the qubits, and I can create these intricate patterns just like the Incans did with their quipu. And in fact, these patterns encode my quantum algorithm and allow me to complete complex operations and solve very challenging problems. And it does so in a protected way. So Leo showed these wiggling electrons, right, the wiggles in his slides. Imagine these strings are wiggling, like a jump rope. If I wiggle the strings of my braid, it doesn't change the braid. It's protected against that kind of noise, this wiggling noise. And that's the key. This is far more robust than other types of qubits and other types of quantum computation, because it's robust against these local noise effects. Now, in terms of the problems we want to solve with this quantum computer, here's one. Here's a 2048-bit number. And this problem underlies the mainstay of e-commerce today. This is how we encrypt your credit card when it goes on the internet, for example, and you're purchasing something. Right? This, is the, this is underlies RSA cryptosystem. Now, if you can tell me the two primes that I multiplied together to get this number, you would probably have a lot more money <laughs> because you'd know everyone's, uh, everyone's credit card numbers. This is a hard problem classically. The reason we rely on this problem, it's a one-way function, and it's hard. It takes a billion years to find those two prime numbers that I multiplied together on a classical computer. Quantumly, we're talking about just 100 seconds. OK, but fear not. We have ways, new ways to encode your information in a quant, uh, you know, once we have quantum computers. We call this post-quantum crypto. So while RSA will be broken by a quantum computer, we have methods you will turn to that we should start turning to now to protect the information against a quantum computer. So indeed, there are cryptosystems that are robust against quantum attacks, and we should all start changing to those systems now. Now, that's one interesting problem. You can see the scale of, in, of speed up we get from the quantum computer. But let's look to other applications. If we take, how do we, you know, when we look at molecules, we want to understand chemical reaction rates. Well, classically, this is an exponential time problem. And we're looking at age of the universe to find solutions. If we want to find the ground state energy of a molecule, we want to understand reaction rates. Even if we come up with a better algorithm on better hardware, let's say we get an exascale supercomputer in the next 10 years, we're barely moving the needle here in terms of the time, the calculation time. On a quantum computer, however, we have amazing scaling, polynomial time scaling. And this means we're looking at days, maybe weeks, for a solution, as opposed to billions and billions of years for a solution on the classical computers. This allows us to solve some of the world's most challenging problems. The key behind this is the exponential scaling of your qubits, of the quantum computer. At 30 qubits, seems like a small number, 30 qubits to simulate that classically requires 16 gigabytes of RAM, of memory. Now, if I add 10 qubits, I move to 40 qubits, that doesn't just linearly grow. It requires 1,000 times more memory for 40 qubits. That's 16 terabytes. 
Let's add 10 more. That's 1,000 times more memory again, 16 petabytes to simulate 50 qubits. Now, if I move to something like 260 qubits, I'm looking at more atoms than there are in the visible universe. That's a pretty powerful machine. Now, that's only 260 qubits. We're talking about scaling to thousands with Microsoft's quantum computer. Imagine the power. That power we can use to solve very challenging problems, problems like nitrogen fixation. Why do we care about nitrogen fixation? Artificial fertilizer production, helping with the world's hunger. We want to more efficiently produce fertilizer. Currently, we use a process from the early 1900s that consumes something like 3% of the world's natural gas, just for fertilizer. Let's improve that. We can use our quantum computer to improve that by finding a catalyst to make that reaction more efficient. Similarly, in carbon capture, we can look to find a catalyst to help us ca extract carbon from the atmosphere, improve and take steps towards combating global warming. Material science, we can look to improve clean energy solutions. We can study materials on the quantum computer, problems that take billions of years classically, we can solve in a matter of days or weeks on our quantum computer find a material that superconducts at higher temperatures, enabling, say, lossless power transmission. And in machine learning, we can look to nature, nature that all we, you know, already is using quantum mechanics to do amazing things every day. What if we harness that kind of problem, you know, that kind of computation for machine learning? Imagine how that transforms speech, vision, models of users, models of data, as we use quantum models to take machine learning to an entirely new level. Now, how am I going to do all of this without tools? Right? I entered quantum computing because I wanted to find out how I could actually program this device. What kind of tools do we need? And I'm really thrilled to announce that Microsoft is releasing a quantum development tool set in preview by the end of the year that allows you to take this and program quantum computers and develop quantum algorithms. It comes with a quantum programming language specific to quantum computing that really allows you to harness the amazing quantum mechanical effects to come up with solutions to your hard problems. It comes integrated in Visual Studio. You get code colorization, debugging, the ability to step through your program. And then just the ability to access, it's more accessible. Many have used Visual Studio before, of course. And then it comes with a quantum simulator so you can test and debug your quantum algorithms locally on your PC, as well as a quantum simulator in Azure that allows you to scale and test on more than 40 qubits. So I encourage all of you to join our quantum community. Please sign up to gain access to our software, learn more about Microsoft's comprehensive approach to quantum computation at microsoft.com slash quantum. I look forward to having you join our Microsoft community and helping us uh, start and empower the quantum revolution together. Thank you. All right, so I think everybody in the room now feels smarter than they did 40 minutes ago. Thank you so much, Chris. That was fantastic. I also want to invite Leo back on stage and just ask a couple of questions uh, before we wrap up the session here. So please welcome back Leo to the stage. So we only have them for a few more minutes because we've got to get them back to the lab and to build this quantum computer thing. So on that point, Leo, where, where are we up to? Where are things at? We've made We've been at this for 20 years, but where are we at? It seems like it's, it's a pivotal time. It is, and uh, we actually now know what we have to do. So we assembled all the necessary equipment. You saw some of the pictures of these uh, giant stainless steel, actually material growth machines. Uh, we hired the people, people in material science and engineering and uh, nanotechnology and in physics, uh, and we're ready to, to build the system. Initial experiments are successful. Uh, we see the right Majoranas that are, you know, are, let's say, robust. They're very strong. And the uh, next step is to make the qubit. Okay. 
I asked the team about this recently. I said, how's it going making the qubits? And they said, we have some really good ones wiggling in the fridge. I wasn't <laughs> quite sure what that meant, but it sounded cool. And so, Krista, tell us a little bit about this, uh, this global team, the importance of the team that we've amassed and the, the different backgrounds they come from. Yeah, so hopefully from this presentation, you can see the diverse set of tasks that we have uh, to tackle to realize a comprehensive, fully scaled out quantum computer. And this includes everything from the qubit technology to engineering the cryogenic control to a brand new cryogenic classical computer, you know, all the way up to the software, and then the algorithms themselves. And this really does require a global dream team, a set of people that come from mathematics, physics, from industry, from academia. Um, and so at Microsoft, we've really brought together people from a diverse range of fields and a diverse range of environments to tackle this problem and bring forward a comprehensive solution for quantum computing. And so then in terms of next steps for people, you talked about a moment ago, we've got a set of technologies coming. How should people prepare for this quantum era? How should they be thinking about it? Where, where can they go learn more? Well, I think step one is visit Microsoft.com slash quantum uh, to gain access to learn more about the solutions we're developing at Microsoft, but then also to get your hands dirty, to jump in, try your first quantum hello world program, join us in building the applications for these amazing machines. Um, definitely get, get dirty and get in the code. All right, sounds good. Well, please, a uh, big hand again for both Krista and Leo. I'll let you both get back to the lab and to build that quantum computer. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. So I hope you enjoyed it. I certainly feel a lot smarter after spending time uh, hanging around with these folks. It still sort of blows my mind a little bit, but I'm starting to get my head around it. But just to summarize, this is the approach that Microsoft is taking. It is a revolutionary, in fact, unique approach around this topological qubit to enable us to create a qubit that requires much less error correction, a unique approach. Also, this global team that we built around the world, bringing together, as Krista said, academics, physicists, mathematics, all into one dream team that we think is on the cusp of doing something magnificent with quantum computing. And then the final piece, building this scalable end-to-end -end technology, scalable in the sense of being able to not have to require millions of qubits to do that error correction, but also scalable in the sense that we're building this thing all the way from the bottom of that refrigerator, the coldest place on Earth maybe, coldest place in the universe, all the way to the top of that stack to build the software and the tools in an environment that you're familiar with, inside of Visual Studio, to be able to go and program the quantum computer just the way that you program computers today. And so as Krista mentioned, to learn more about this, I would encourage you to go to microsoft.com slash quantum. We have a set of resources, newsletters that you can sign up to and you can hear more about the journey that we're on and hear more about the announcements that we will be making over the coming months. So I hope you enjoyed that session. I'm gonna wrap it up here. I'm gonna hand back to Claire Barkley, our COO. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you.